Hello lovelies. So if you're watching this, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you're probably a tarot reader. And if that's true, I feel pretty confident going out on another limb and saying that you've probably said at one time or another, I don't like decks that blank, like have this very specific characteristic. I know I have, to be very specific, eight different characteristics that I've listed here. But I wanted to do a video about the decks that are an exception to that rule. The ones that have warmed their way into my heart despite having characteristics that I sweepingly state that I don't like. <laughs> In other words, these are the decks that are the exception to my rule. So let's try and make this a tag. I'll call it Tarot of Exception. Yeah, I like that. All right, so I'm Tara, this is Cozy Core Craft, and let's dive right into the decks. So I've written down eight characteristics that are typically a turnoff for me, but then I've picked eight decks that are the exception to that. And if you want to do a VR or a tag for this, obviously pick however many you want, do it any way that you want. Just make sure you tag me in it so I can see, because I love stuff like this. So the first point that I wrote down that is usually a instant no for me is anthropomorphic animals. I always say if I ever hear about a deck that has anthropomorphic animals or I see one, my gut reaction is no, especially if those anthropomorphic animals have other animals with them that are just regular animals. That is seems like a very weird, weird world to me. It's like the Pluto goofy kind of thing. But my exception to this one is the Medieval Cat Tarot. This deck, I didn't even really, I mean, obviously it's anthropomorphized cats and I didn't even really register, sorry about the little light, but that's what it was. Like I just loved it so much that I never really paid attention to the fact that it's um, anthropomorphized cats. The aces do have animals in them and then the Miners are quite pippish, but they do have these like very little illustrations that are really great depictions of the meaning of the cards. But I just love this deck. I find it very easy to read with. I don't see it very often on Tarot 2, but I think it's a hidden gem. It's mass market. It's produced by US Games. And I, I don't know. It's just, it's always been an easy breezy reader for me. I usually pick it up in the winter. I want to try and find, it's typically I think the knights that have like the anthropomorphized cat with like a regular horse or something like that. Let me try and find. Okay, here's a good example. We have a cat with a lion, both felines. Like I know, it's a fantasy world, but it just doesn't like, something about it makes me very uncomfortable, but this deck, as is the point of this entire video, is the exception to that and I love it so so much. Another instant no for me, oh I have so many glossy ones today, <laughs> is oracles with no keywords or even tarot with no titles. That would be difficult for me but the exception to this one is soul cards one and I don't have soul cards too but I'm pretty sure it's the same in the sense that it's similar illustrations and no keywords, no titles, no nothing. And the guidebook doesn't even help as far as the individual works of art, but it does give some context to the art, if that makes any sense. But this one is just so evocative, so beautiful, so full of depth. I find it very easy to work with this one. I find it more useful for me, at least, as a prompt for meditation or even journaling and not so much as an oracle the way I would typically use like my average oracle but this one is awesome this one is never leaving me and this one is the exception to that rule number three on my list is modern decks I usually as soon as I hear or see hear about or see a modern deck I'm like eh, it kind of makes me need a little bit more convincing the exception to that for me is the Pulp Tarot. And to be fair, this isn't, I guess, I guess this would technically be considered retro, but I still think of it as modern in the sense that it's a world that I recognize. There's elements of it that still exist in our world. 
for the most part, but it feels removed enough that I can read with it and not have my readings be colored by like current events or anything like that, which I'm sure is important for some people in their reading, but for me and just the way that my brain works, I like my readings to have more of an abstract or maybe otherworldly or just not so rooted in the current reality type of situation going on with them. It tends to make me pull in, you know, my own biases and emotions about the current state of things. And I feel like that can kind of take away from my readings for myself. Again, this is just for me, but I love this deck. This one is awesome. Another easy reader. That's like a theme with all the decks I chose, I think is, and maybe that's what makes them the exception to the rule, but this one is a beautiful one and I treasure it. My fourth characteristic applies to one of my absolute favorite decks. And this is something again that I didn't really pick on, pick up on about this deck until someone in the Tarot 2 community mentioned it. And when they did, they did, I was like, oh no, I'm not going to like the Everyday Witch anymore. But my love for this deck could not be shaken. And the characteristic, I guess I should mention, is inconsistency. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So again, this is one of the first decks I ever got. It's one of my absolute favorites. Okay, this is a good example. So here we have a little pointy hat witch with her sweet little cat. I absolutely love this card. And she's on a motorcycle, right? So like a modern, okay, this is a really good example, a modern type of situation, modern dress and all that kind of stuff. And then we have this more medieval type of feel. And this is consistently inconsistent <laughs> throughout the deck. And again, I think my love for this deck just blinded me to that characteristic for the longest time. And then again, when I found out about it, I was like, no, but I still love it. It doesn't even phase me. But that is something that if I heard it like in a review or was noted or I saw it in a preview image or something like that, I might be a little bit hesitant to pick it up. But this one again, so yeah, here we see like yoga, kind of a modern looking house, martini, cupcakes, all that kind of stuff, right? And then here we have our medieval king of swords. But I can't be shaken. I can't be deterred. I love this one so much. I ask you, who among us actually needs another Rider Waite Smith clone? I definitely do not. And although I actually have many examples I could show you to this rule, this is the one that I use the most. And this rule for me is Rider Waite Smith clones. Whenever I hear that, I'm like, I don't need that. I don't want that. But here I am showing you one. And this is one that I carry with me everywhere. I use it all the time. And it is my little beloved gummy bear tarot in a tin. It's cute as hell. It is a perfect replica of the Rider Waite Smith, but just cuter. I love that it's a tin deck. I love that I can throw it in my bag. It is an easy reader for me and it just warms my heart. I just love it so much. Look at these little guys, absolute sweethearts. My next one is big ass cards. Why? I still, this is one of the things that actually does still bother me, but I love this deck, the Enchanted Tarot so much, specifically actually more so the guidebook. I do think, like look how big these are. Why? I have long hands. People always say I have piano hands. I'm sure, oh, look, I can't even hold it well enough to show you guys but anyways i understand that the art is um detailed enough and it's it's tapestry art so i imagine that the original pieces are quite large so i understand these cards being so big but it's just totally unwieldy i'm never going to use it in a spread i do pull single cards and i feel like the guidebook is set up and rich enough that you could just pull one card and go to the guidebook. I think if you use it with the guidebook, for me at least, it's worthwhile, but it does still grind my friggin' gears every time I pull it off or pull it out. And 
I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but I do think they came out with an edition that is smaller. I tried to look it up online and see if I could find out how big those cards were, but it wasn't obvious and then I just got lazy. But anyways, this one is the exception to the rule. Whenever I hear about cards being giant, I'm just like, yeah, no, not for me. Highly specific alternate systems. This isn't my only example of this, but this is my favorite example of this, which is the Cosma Visions Oracle. This is one of the most beautiful decks that I own, and it just feels like pure luxury in the hands. And the system is kind of similar to Tarot a little bit, but in reverse. And I do think that the guidebook is a really great support in the use with this deck. I do also find the art incredibly evocative. So even if I don't wanna to pay too much attention to the system itself or even dive into the guidebook, I still find that I can use this for the most part. Most of the time when I hear about a independent or very unique system, although I'm intrigued and think it's cool, I just know that realistically, I probably won't put in the time to learn it the way that I should, the way that it would deserve to be learned and the way that I would get the most out of the cards. But this one is just so beautiful. I need to get um, his tarot. I can only imagine what a beautiful pairing it would be with this deck. But yeah, this one I think is just such a treasure. And I think this creator is kind of notorious for creating really incredible and quality decks. Last but not least is photo decks. And here to make an absolute liar out of me is the Nature Speak Oracle. So I do really like photo collage decks, but photo decks in general are not for me. Now to be fair, the aesthetic of this one is not for me. It, it doesn't do anything for me. But these cards, the idea of the elements, and then the keywords as well as the guidebook are just awesome. I've had so many good experiences with this deck and I love it so much. I've really waffled back and forth on the Somnia Tarot. That's the only one that's really tempted me. And then I saw that they came out with the illustrated version and I thought that that would be it for me. But then when I saw a comparison video between the two, it was funny because the photographs where we had like the cloaked figures that looked very otherworldly, especially the ones with like the firelight or candlelight or something like that. I liked the photos better. And then in the illustrated deck, in the cards that had kind of a little bit more modern or not creepy looking people in them and didn't rely so much on the light to add the feeling to the card, I liked it better in the illustrated. So anyways, I'm still on the fence about that one. That one make, might make a hypocrite out of me as well. But for now, this is kind of my favorite and I think only photography deck that I own. But it is, again, another little treasure. So that's it. I think this was a short and sweet one, but I'd be very curious to hear what decks make a liar of you, make you feel like a hypocrite, <laughs> and are the exception to the rule for things that you typically do not look for or absolutely love in tarot and or oracle decks. So as always, thank you so much for being here. I am so grateful to share this space with you guys. Keep your mind strong and your heart soft, and I will see you very soon. Take care.